All right, hello and welcome back to Provavilus. Uh Yeah, so today we're gonna do quite a bit of things. Um, got a double header plan for today, and we're gonna start with talking about physics content, uh, particularly physics one. So let's jump into it, see what we're learning about today. Today we're learning about energy. Uh, I tried recording this yesterday, but my audio was off the entire time, so we're redoing it. Um, so yeah, we're talking about energy, which is probably my favorite topic in Physics 1, because it's quite simple in terms of formulas and stuff, yet it's extremely powerful. As always, we're going to do a bunch of practice problems after we go through some of the content, um, and we're going to see that we can use concepts from energy in all sorts of problems, and they're going to simplify what seem to be really complex problems into very, very easy calculations. First, we need to figure out what is energy. So basically, energy just relates to an object's ability to do work. Uh, and we discussed what work was in the last unit, uh, last week. So if you watched our last video on work, um, in the middle, I introduced a formula which looks something like this. Work equals one half mv final squared minus one half mv initial squared. And I called this the work energy theorem. And I said, ah, we won't worry about that for now. So now we'll start to explore this equation just a little bit. And indeed, this equation does relate energy with work. So there is a relationship between these two quantities here. And we also know that work is equal to f times d times cosine of theta. So if energy is related to work, and work is related to some sort of force, then energy relates to the ability to do a certain force. So that is the brief explanation of what energy is. And to introduce energy, we're going to be discussing two main types of energy. So the first one is called kinetic energy. And this is the energy associated with the moving objects. So objects that have a non-zero velocity, uh, things in motion. And our formula for it is Ke, which is what we abbreviate kinetic energy to be. Ke is equal to 1 half mv squared. So m is the mass of the object, and v is the velocity of the object. Um, and the units for kinetic energy are in joules. So basically all forms of energy, their units will be in joules. So this is our equation, and we use it when we have an object in motion. So we have a little question at the bottom here. What's the kinetic energy of a 100 kilogram vehicle traveling at a speed of 30 meters per second? Well, we're given that mass equals 100 kilograms. We're given velocity equals 30 meters per second. So we can just use our equation, Ke equals 1 half mv squared. So that's equal to 1 half times 100 times 30 squared, and that should be equal to, what is this, 45, 0, 0, 0, something like that, joules, and, you know, units follow the same convention, so we can also call that 45 kilojoules. So yeah, that's just a pretty simple plug and chug problem right there, but that's just to get us introduced to kinetic energy. Uh, it's just a camera. Okay. So now here's our second main type of energy. That's not to say that there are only two types of energy. There are so many other types of energy. Some of them we'll explore a little bit later on, and some of them we won't even touch in this course. Um, but these two are very important. So the second one is called gravitational potential energy, and we abbreviate it as PE for potential energy, or U, uh, which may relate to it being called universal potential energy. Uh, not too sure about that, so we use these interchangeably. And this is the energy that an object possesses due to its position in a gravitational field. So this energy is, well, objects that are not in motion, they can have potential energy, but objects that are also in motion may also have potential energy. So, whereas kinetic energy was solely for moving objects, um, 
Well, we could also consider it being for non-moving objects, but then when we plug it into our formula here, the velocity will go to zero, so the kinetic energy would also be zero. Uh, potential energy, it doesn't matter if the object is moving or not. What it depends on is its relative position to some sort of baseline. That might seem a little bit confusing, but we will be seeing uh, what this means a lot in our practice problems. So, um, and this is used for objects near the surface of Earth. So we assume that lowercase g equals 9.8 meters per second squared. And that's because this is our equation right here. Um, I have these deltas to do change in uh, potential energy, but we can do it without it. So change in potential energy is equal to change in potential energy. And that is equal to m times g times delta h. So m we know is mass. G, we just described, is 9.8 meters per second squared. Delta H. H stands for height. So it's the change in vertical height of the object. Um, so if we were to just disregard the deltas, our equation would be potential energy is equal to MGH. And that value of H is the vertical distance from some baseline of h equals zero that we set. And again, that might seem a little bit confusing, but when we do some practice problems, I'll be sure to explain why this is the case. Um, and additionally, this change in potential energy applies for any change in height. It does not need to be a straight line change in height. So the object can move in whatever fashion, and as long as it changes vertical height, then there will be a change in potential energy because h is defined to be the vertical change in height. So sort of like how when an object was moving along some path for displacement, we only took the straight line distance between the start and end points, similar thing here with delta h. And last thing is that gravitational potential energy can be converted into kinetic energy. Um, so an object that has high potential energy can suddenly start moving and then it gains some kinetic energy, but that might cause it to lose potential energy, things like that. And that ties into one of the most important things, if not the most important things, uh, when it comes to energy. And that is, well, at least in this class, total energy is conserved, which means energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Um, so yeah, as an object moves around, its total energy will stay the same. Um, and for most of these problems, we'll ignore some other energies, like we won't worry about uh, the presence of thermal energy and stuff like that. We'll just look at the two types of energy we've learned thus far and say that it's conserved. So at some starting point, the total energy will equal the total energy of some final point. So we have a nice little equality there. Um, and then it's also good to know, I guess I'll just write it. So we said E at some initial point is equal to E at some final point. Um, just zoom in here a little bit. Uh, and we define E to be total energy. So this is going to be the sum of our potential energy and our kinetic energy. So our this equation can be rewritten as u initial plus ke initial equals u final plus ke final. And this is our conservation of energy equation. This is going to be super helpful in a ton of problems that we do. Uh, so this is good to have down. Great, so total energy is conserved. Very important to remember. So let's just discuss some strategies for energy problems. Um, so actually, we'll start at these bottom points here. And it's mentioned that energy is conserved from some starting point to some finish point. And what I wrote here is just the equation that I wrote previously, where if the energy at the start equals the energy at the finish, then the sum of potential and kinetic energy at the start is equal to the sum of potential and energy, potential and kinetic energy at the finish point. OK, now let's look at the first point here. We should always define a starting level where h equals 0. So what that means is when we have a problem, we're actually just going to go ahead and draw a horizontal line at some point and say, 
this is where we're setting h equals to 0, and the height of every object is going to be dependent on that line. We can put it wherever we want, as long as everything else is relative to that line. And we're going to see how placing the h equals 0 line at different places will still give us the same answers in just a couple moments. So, at least in my opinion, it's nice when all of like the motion or all of the movement occurs above the h equals 0 line, so that way we work with positive numbers only. Um, otherwise, you know, we might dip below the h equals 0 line and then it's negative numbers. It basically comes down to personal preference. Again, you can put h equals 0 wherever you want. Uh, it doesn't really matter. This is just what I prefer to do. Uh, but like I said, we'll experiment with it uh, in one of our practice problems. So speaking of which, we're just going to jump into our first question. And this comes from a past AP exam. And let's just read through it together. Uh, so a physics class is asked to design a low friction slide that will launch a block horizontally from the top of a lab table. Teams 1 and 2 assemble the slides shown above and use identical blocks 1 and 2 respectively. Both slides start at the same height d above the tabletop, however team 2's table is lower than team 1's table. To compensate for the lower table, team 2 constructs the right end of the slide to rise above the tabletop so that the block leaves the slide horizontally at the same height h above the floor as does team 1's block. So it sort of, you know, goes down here and then it goes up slightly so that way it leaves at the same exact height that it does for team 1. And we're asked, both blocks are released from rest at the top of their respective slides. From rest, let's highlight that. Do block 1 and block 2 land the same distance from their respective tables? Okay, so before we even consider like what the block does as it slides down the ramp, um, let's think Let's think how we consider the horizontal distance, like how far the block would travel. Whoops, that's not what I wanted. So like the block comes down here, and then it launches off, and then it goes to some horizontal distance. And that's what we're trying to compare. Same thing here. It goes here, and we want this horizontal distance. So in what case would those distances be the same? Well, if they're falling from the same height, and the acceleration due to gravity is the same, base, and the blocks are exactly the same, the only way for them to go the same distance is if their velocities are the same. Because then literally we have the same scenario going on. We don't care what happens a priori to the thing flying off, we just care what happens the moment it starts flying off of the table. And if we compare the balls or the blocks at the moment it flies off the table, if they have the same velocity, then they're going to go the same distance. So that's kind of what we want to find. We want to compare the velocities at these endpoints here uh, to see if they are equal or not equal. So what I'm going to do is just put a little star here and here to denote the final location that we're looking at. And at the top here, I'll just put this as like a star with a zero to denote the initial. So what we're going to do is we're going to use conservation of energy. We know that energy is conserved, so E initial should equal E final. Great. So let's take a look at um, the block. But before we do that, we have to set our baseline of h equals 0. This is going to be a horizontal line. I can put it wherever I want. Personally, I'm going to put it at the ground. Um, so right here, I'm going to call this to be h equals 0. You can put it wherever you want. You can put it at the table height if you want to. If you want, you could put it up here. I just chose at the ground because everything's occurring above it. All right, cool. So now let's look here. Let's try to compute the energy initially. So we know E initial is going to be the sum of the initial potential energy and kinetic energy. And by formula, that's mgh initial plus 1 half mv squared initial. 
we're given from the problem that the blocks are released from rest, which means initially their velocities are zero. So this term goes to zero. So that means we have the initial energy is equal to mgh naught. So what is h naught? That is defined to be the height of the block, the vertical height of the block, in relation to the h equals zero line. So we have h equals zero down here. Our block is up here. So we need this distance. Well, we have h is this half distance, and d is this distance. So the overall height should be h plus d. So we can say that this is equal to m g h plus d. OK, and we'll leave it at that. Let's look at the final position here. So I'm going to just sort of draw a line. So E final, that's going to be the sum of our potential energy and kinetic energy. That's going to be equal to mghf plus 1 half mvf squared. And now there is an associated velocity, right? Because the block is moving when it reaches this point. Or, well, I mean, we, we hope so. Right? Otherwise, not really, not really sure what happened, and we know that the slides are pretty much frictionless, so the block must have had some issues with it. But anyways, there, there is an associated velocity here, so that does not go to zero. What about this? What is the final height? Well, we turn back to our definition. H is measured as the vertical distance from where the block is at that position to the H equals zero line. So if we're at this star, we are at a distance h from the h equals 0 line. So the final uh, energy is equal to mgh plus 1 half mv squared. And that's equal to energy final. So we have two equations now. We're trying to solve for this v final. And we know that energy initial equals energy final. So we can set those equal to each other and solve for velocity. So I guess I'll do it like somewhere here. So mgh plus d equals mgh plus 1 half mv squared. We see that there's an m in all three terms. So those cancel out. Um, we can expand this left-hand side to be gh plus gd equals gh plus 1 half v squared. So there's a gh term on both sides. Those cancel as well. And then we can solve for v squared and say that it's uh, v squared is going to be equal to 2gh or 2gd. And then we take the square root of that to get v. So we have an expression for the velocity at this point. Now we have to do it for the second team to see if those velocities are equal or not equal. And we'll do a very similar thing, conservation of energy. So what is the energy here? Again, this is equal to U initial plus Ke initial, which is equal to MGH initial plus 1 half MV squared initial. We know that the block starts from rest, so this term should go to 0. And it does. Uh, so this simplifies a little bit. The initial equals mgh initial. So now, again, we have to figure out what is h initial. Uh, I'll say it again. I'm going to be repeating it throughout this entire lesson. h is measured as the vertical distance from where the block is to the h equals 0 line. The h equals 0 line is this blue line. So we need this vertical distance. Um, we know that this distance is d, so we need the height of the table, basically. We know that the table is smaller than h, because h goes up to here, but that this little bit is already accounted for uh, with d. So actually, this height, this total height, is going to be smaller than d plus h. We can't give it an exact value, but we know it's going to be smaller than it. So this is going to be mg 
and this is going to be some strange notation, but I'm going to put a less than symbol, d plus h. Okay? And then we will turn to the final position. Er, yeah. So, again, same equation that we're used to be seeing at this point. mghf plus one-half mvf squared. So that's going to be equal to mgh, because at this point we are at a height h above the h equals zero line, plus one-half mvf squared. And that's equal to EF. So once again, we have these two. We can set them equal to each other. Uh, so let's do that. MG less than D plus H equals MGH plus one half MVF squared. And you're like, wait a second. This looks very similar to what we just did. Uh, let me just change this a little bit to be H plus D. In fact, the only difference between this and this is that this third term here, this less than h plus d, is not the same. So the left-hand side of this equation is greater than the left-hand side of this equation. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, well, let's see. That is, well, just looking at that, if we know that this is less than that, then we have two different equations. So our final answer for velocity on this side will not be the same as this. And we can just plug it in and check. Let's consider that the velocity is actually the same. So we keep everything else the same, mg less than h plus d, equals mgh plus one-half m, and we're going to multiply this by the square root of 2g, what is it, 2gd squared. We'll just substitute it in and see if we get an equality. If it is equal, then we found v to be equal to team 1, but if not, then we know that they're not equal, and that's kind of what we're looking for. We're just looking to see if the velocities are equal or not. Okay, so let's compute this. mg uh, less than h plus d equals mgh plus one half m times 2gd. So this cancels with this. Bring this down here. mg less than h plus d equals mgh plus mgd. So mg less than h plus d equals mg h plus d. And here we see that this is not equal to each other because this term right here is specifically less than h plus d because that was this height right here. And that sum, h plus d, overcounts this little bit. So we know they're not equal to each other. So the velocity here does not equal the velocity to the right, so that means they do not go the same distance uh, from their respective tables because the velocities are different. This is a very long-winded explanation for why the answer is no. Um, in fact, you're probably not expected to write this on an AP test, but since this is, this is our first question of the day, I wanted to go through step-by-step step comparing these energies. Um, you could basically just say that block 2 starts at a lower height than block 1, so the kinetic energies at the end will be different. Uh, that's perfectly valid. Uh, but this is a, you know, more thorough solution, and we see why the velocities indeed are different. Wonderful. Let us continue chugging along. So this is the second part. Um, so in another experiment, team 1 and 2... Teams 1 and 2 use tables and low friction slides with the same height. However, the two slides have different shapes as shown below. So one is more steep, whereas the other one is like shallow in the beginning. Um, and then it gets steeper towards the end. Uh, and then both are at a height h here. 
Okay, so if both blocks are released from rest at the top of their slides at the same time, which block, if either, lands farther from its respective table? All right, so this is similar to the question that we just had. Um, yeah, so once again, we will be comparing the uh, velocities at the launch points. So let's just take a look here at the energy. This is equal to u plus k e initial. I'm going to change my marker. Uh, so that's going to be equal to mgh initial plus 1 half mv not in, uh, squared. But we know the initial velocity is 0, so this goes to 0. So the energy is equal to uh, mgh naught. That's going to be equal to mgh plus d, because we are measuring this height, which is h plus d. Cool. So now let's look at the final position here. And again, we'll use energy. U final plus Ke final. That's MGH. I'm just going to do the substitution right there because that is indeed the height. Plus 1 half MV squared, V final squared. Right? And we can set these two equal to each other. So we'll have the equation MGH plus D equals mgh plus one-half mvf squared. I won't bother simplifying that just yet because we can do that later. Let's take a look at block two, uh, and we'll do a very similar thing. Let's look at the initial energy. u naught plus ke naught equals mgh naught plus one-half mv naught squared. Again, the initial velocity is zero, so the second term goes to zero. So this is m g h plus d. Same thing, same height, d plus h. Okay, now let's look at the launching point. So that has some associated final energy, u f plus k e f. That's going to be equal to m g h plus one half m v final squared. So again, we can set initial energy equal to final energy since energy is conserved. And we have mgh plus d equals mgh plus one half mvf squared. And then we can see that, okay, this equation and this equation are exactly the same. So the final velocities we compute will be exactly the same for the two cases. So that means if they have the same final velocity at this launching point and the heights that they're falling are the same and the acceleration due to gravity is the same and the blocks have the same mass everything is the same that means they will they will be falling they will be going the same distance from their respective table so the answer to this one would be this third option and uh, it says to briefly explain your reasoning without manipulating equations so for this, we can say that the blocks start out at the exact same height, and they both have the same exact potential energy, and no kinetic energy associated with them. And then at their launching points, they have the same potential energy, because their masses and their heights are the same, and they both do have kinetic energy. Since total energy is conserved, that would mean that the kinetic energy at these two points are equal, which means their final velocities at that point are equal. So basically exactly what we had just done with the formula, except explain it with words. Uh, so I'm not going to write that out for the sake of time, uh, but hopefully that explanation made sense. And now we're asked which block, if either, hits the floor first. Okay, before we even think about doing any calculations, uh, in fact, we're not going to do any calculations for this question. Let's just think about it. Which block do we think will hit the ground first? Well, we know that their final velocities here are the same, so the time it takes for this free fall portion is going to be the same regardless. So it just comes down to whether or not they get to this point at the same time or different times. And if you just look at it, 
you might be thinking that, mm, I'm feeling like block one will reach this point quicker. It just kind of looks like it. And in fact, that's pretty much the answer. Um, they will not hit the floor at the same time, and the one that will hit the floor first is block one. And the explanation for this is quite intriguing. So let's just analyze block one first. It gets dropped, and at some point in time, pretty soon after, it's just like here, right? So in just a little bit of time, it has fallen a substantial distance. It will give this like some h prime. So since total energy is conserved, it has lost some potential energy because we're at a lower height than up here, and it has some kinetic energy. Uh, it has some associated with velo some associated velocity because we need to conserve energy. So at the start, we only have this and we don't have this. At this point here where we dropped by h prime, this u will go down a little bit, which means this ke must go up to keep this constant. So that means at a very short period after this block is dropped, this block has some decent velocity to it. And then let's just look a couple moments afterwards. I'll call this like h double prime. We're here. Now, the block has lost a lot of potential energy from where it started because we're at a significantly lower height, which means at this moment in time, the block has a much higher velocity than before. So as it goes down this ramp, as time progresses, it gains velocity as we expect it to, but it gains velocity at a very quick rate. We can see that just a moment after it's dropped, the block already has substantial velocity. Moving over here, if we do a similar thing, just moments after it's released, the block is only here. So this change in height is very small. It's a very tiny h prime that we change, which means that, yes, we want this to be conserved. This goes down a little bit, so that means ke must go up a little bit. So it has a velocity, but it's a very small velocity which is fine. Let's look again. Moments later, we're here. So again, we have lost a little bit of height, but overall, it's not much height that's been lost. It still has some associated velocity. It is gaining velocity, but compared to the first case, it's not gaining velocity as quickly as this block. So since this block is gaining velocity a lot quicker than this one, we expect this block to reach its launch point quicker than block two. And that is, once again, the long-winded explanation of this part right here. And in my explanation, I would basically just write whatever I've been saying. Um, so yeah, that is amazing. We've been able to do a full AP free response question. Uh, so pat yourself on the back uh, if you were able to follow through. And if not, feel free to watch back. Uh, we're going to move on to our second question, which is like the quintessential conservation of energy problem. Uh, and this one features my amazing drawing of a roller coaster. I'm sure you knew that was a roller coaster right away. But basically we're asked, what's the final speed of the 20 kilogram roller coaster if it starts from rest at the top of the hill? And we're going to assume that friction is negligible. Okay, so... If we think about how to do this with um, what we already know, uh, we might get stuck really quickly because, I mean, I don't even know how to approach this. Uh, it could be like two-dimensional kinematics, but I don't really know how to do that because it's like following a certain path or something. And one-dimensional kinematics doesn't make sense because it's not traveling in a straight line only. Circular motion doesn't make sense. We're not traveling in a circle. So already a huge point of confusion for this seemingly simple problem. But we'll see that we're going to use conservation of energy, and that'll make it a whole lot easier. So before we get into that, I'm going to take a sip, quick sip of water. Okay. So like I said, we're going to be using 
conservation of energy. And lucky for us, we've been provided an h equals zero line. It's right here. So I said lucky for us, but depending on how you look at it, it may be unlucky because we don't have the freedom of choosing h equals zero. Um, so now we have to consider like what's our initial point and what's our final point. So it should be clear that this is the initial point. And then somewhere along this horizontal plateau, this will be like our final position. And we want to say that E initial equals E final. Okay, so let's look initially. The block starts from rest, so that's going to be key. Uh, let's use the color pink here. So E initial equals U initial plus K E initial. So that's going to be equal to M G H initial plus one half M V initial squared. As we just mentioned, the initial velocity is zero, so that goes to zero, which means the initial energy is equal to mgh initial. Not going to worry about making any substitutions for the moment, just keep it in terms of the variables that we have. Cool. So, um, actually, let me just copy this, and we're going to move down here where there's some more space. So I'll say this is the initial point here, and then final, let me use this color here, and then we will paste what we just did. Okay, so now let's look at the final position, EF. So that's going to be equal to UF plus KEF. So that's MGHF plus one half MV final squared. Okay. Does the block have an associated height with it? Yes, it does, because it's not at the h equals zero line at our final position. And similarly, there is an associated velocity, so we can't cancel anything out. So that's our final energy. So with conservation of energy, since these two are equal, we can set these two equations equal to each other. So let's do that. MGH initial equals MGH final plus one half m v final squared. And what are we trying to solve for? Uh, final speed, so we're trying to solve for velocity. Well, we can see that there's an m in each term, so those can cancel out. And then we can isolate for the velocity, so one half v f squared equals g h initial minus g h final. So we get that v f squared equals g 2g times h initial minus h final, which means that the final velocity equals the square root of 2g h initial minus h final. So we have it in terms of variables. We can substitute it in, which we will do in just a moment. But what's interesting to see here is that we see that velocity only depends on, well, this constant here, 2 times g, g is the constant, 9.8. But it only depends on the change in the heights, the initial height minus the final height. It doesn't depend on the mass of the roller coaster. It doesn't depend on anything else. It just depends on the change of heights. So now it remains to find what is the initial and final height. So if this is our h equals zero line, and height is measured as the vertical distance from the h equals zero line to where we're at, Initially, we are here, so we want this vertical height, and to lucky us, we've been supplied that that is 25 meters, so this is equal to h initial. At the final point, we're somewhere here, so once again, we need the final height vertical distance from where we are to the h equals zero line, so that is this distance, which we've been supplied to be 5 meters, so this is going to be equal to hf. So if we just scroll back here, we get that vf is equal to square root of 2 times 9.8 times 25 for the initial height minus 5 for the final height, square root of that, and we could, should get 6.26 6 6 meters per second. And that solves the problem. I just want you to take a moment to realize 
how amazing of a solution this actually is. If we just look at what we started with, we did not know how to approach this problem using any information known to us previously before energy. All we did was just use this simple equation at two places, set it equal to each other, and boom, we know the final velocity at this point. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. And this is why when I opened the video, I mentioned that energy is one of my favorite things because it's so, so powerful. And we've already seen that such a simple solution to this problem. And there's so many more applications. Let's dive into uh, it in just a moment. We're going to do, do, do that's not good. Uh, let me take care of that. All right. OK, should be good. Um, we're going to do the same problem first, uh, except now the difference is that we've changed where the h equals 0 line is. Before, it was at the bottom here. Now we're putting it at this plateau uh, to be h equals 0. And we're going to do the same exact thing, find the final speed of the roller coaster. And so there's a workspace here, so let's use it. This will be our initial position. Uh, let me use blue again here. This will be our final position. Uh, and we'll do the same thing. We know initial energy is going to equal final energy. So initially, it's the sum of potential and kinetic energy, mgh0 plus 1 half mv0 squared. We know the initial velocity is 0, which is great. So we can just say initial energy equals mgh0. We'll keep it in terms of variables and plug things in later. Let's turn to final energy. That's going to be the sum of our individual energies. Just use the formulas, mgh final plus 1 half mv final squared. Okay, and yeah, we can't really simplify anything else because we're not given that like it ends at rest. So we'll just keep it like that. Now we'll set these two equal to each other. Uh, so this is equal to mghf plus 1 half mvf squared, mgh naught. And again, we're solving for final velocity. This is actually the exact same equation as this up here. So I'm just going to jump ahead to this step. Uh, and we said that Vf equals square root of 2 times g times h initial minus hf. So now it remains to find what is h initial and what is h final. Let's zoom in here. Again, I'll say it again. Height is measured as the vertical distance from where we are at to the h equals 0 line. So initially, we are some point here. The h equals 0 line is here, so our value for h is this vertical distance. Last time, we were blessed with the value of 25 meters, but that doesn't work here, because 25 meters is this height when we only want this smaller height. So if we take this height and subtract the height below the h equals 0 line, then we will get the height that we're looking for. So if we're given this 25 and we're also given this 5, then we can just subtract those and say that h initial equals 25 minus 5 equals 20. OK, what about at our final position? Well, we're right here on this plateau, and that's where h equals 0 is defined. So that means that here, h final is equal to 0. So with these values, let's substitute it back into this equation. And we get 2 times 9.8 times 20 minus 0. Those are our new height values. And it turns out we will get the exact same answer. Should that surprise you that we got the exact same answer? Hopefully you're saying no. Um, it would be absolutely crazy if we got a different answer because the only thing that changed between this problem and the previous part was we took a line, h equals 0, an imaginary line that we created, and we just moved it to a different place. That's all that happened. Everything else, the physics of it stayed exactly the same. And really, all that happened was these individual terms, h0 minus hf. 
we're taking the difference between them. So in both cases, we're actually just finding this height uh, for the most part, no matter where you set the h equals zero line. So this height is always going to be a constant 20 meters. And we see that this evaluates to 20, this evaluates to 20. So it doesn't matter where we put h equals zero, we get the same answer regardless. So that's what I alluded to in the beginning of the video and we see it here now. So yeah, choose h equals zero wherever you want, just be sure to do it because your calculations for potential energy depend on where you set h equals zero. Wonderful. Uh, let us move on to another question and a completely different application of it. We're going to be dealing with satellites now. Uh, so a little bit different. What is the kinetic energy of a satellite of mass m that orbits the Earth of mass capital M in a circular orbit of radius r? So let us draw a picture because I like pictures. So we have the Earth and then I'm going to draw the orbit of this satellite. Some sort of circular path. Oh no. Um, yeah, there we go. Okay, so that's the circular path and we have some satellite here. Um, and then there's some radius r that it follows. Okay, uh, great. And we know that kinetic energy equals one half mv squared. So quickly, what is the m? Is it lowercase m or is it capital M? Well, we're trying to find the kinetic energy of a satellite. So the kinetic energy should be related to the satellite, so it's lowercase m. All right, so what's a v squared? I don't know. Uh, we're not given velocity, but we can find it. So let's look here. We have the Earth. We have a satellite, and we have a cir circular path. Alarms should be ringing in your head that we should be doing circular motions, centripetal forces, stuff like that, and you'd be absolutely correct. So we should consider what are the forces present on the satellite. And there's only one, and that would be the gravitational force, F sub G. And now you're thinking, okay, let us sum the forces in that direction. So we'll do it, the sum of the forces centripetally equals mac, right? We're not really sure what we're doing. It just seems kind of relevant to do it, right? Why not? We have a circle, we have some forces, hopefully it'll help us out. Okay, so this is fg equals mac, but then you remember, wait a second, I know what ac equals. That's equal to v squared over r. And I'll use a capital R because R is the radius of the circular path, and that's capital R. And now we're like, okay, great. We have a V squared term, which is what we desperately need. So this is getting us somewhere. We have FG equals MV squared over R. And you might get a little bit overexcited and say, okay, MG equals M times V squared over R. But you have to be really careful. It's not MG because we're not near the surface of the Earth. When we're dealing with gravitation, objects away from Earth, we have to use our other formula for Fg. So this is G times M1, M2 over R squared. Okay, so what are M1 and M2? Those are the masses of the two objects uh, in play. So that would be the mass of the satellite and the mass of Earth. R is the distance that separates them, which happens to be capital R in this case, so we're good there. Um, so let's simplify this a little bit more. We get G times lowercase m times capital M over R squared equals lowercase m times V squared over R. So this cancels with this. This R cancels with one of these R's. And we're left with gm over r equals v squared. And we did this because we wanted to plug it into this kinetic energy equation. So let's do that now. Kinetic energy equals one half mv squared. So that's one half m, lowercase m, times gm over r. And we can just refactor this to say gm over r. And if we look at our answer choices, that is in fact 
choice A. So there we go. Um, kind of just solve, solving for an energy uh, using things that we learned previously. So we didn't use energy to solve the equation, uh, sort of the opposite, but still very helpful. We see energy applies to even objects in circular motion and in gravitation. Uh, so yeah, there we go. Let's move on to the next question. I'm going to take another sip of water and you can read this. Okay, so we want to find a point where the kinetic energy and potential energies of the ball are equal, which seems quite challenging, and I won't lie, it is. Um, but we're given that at point two, the potential energy is zero. So we know that U equals mgh and Ke equals one half mv squared. So if potential energy is zero, then this quantity has to be equal to zero. Well, we know that mass is not equal to zero because that would be a really strange ball then. And we know that G is not zero, that's 9.8. So it must be that H is equal to zero. So with that said, we can draw our H equals zero line. And that is going to be right here. So this time we can't be free to choose wherever we put our H equals zero line. We need it at this specific point um, because we need the potential energy to be zero there. That's a given to us. Okay, wonderful. Let's take a look at each of these points, one, four, and three, and then we can analyze the potential energies and kinetic energies later if we need to. So what happens at points one and four? Well, the ball like swings up, it reaches point four, and then it comes back down. So if we trace the velocity vector uh, here, it's like this, 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 here. But then at 4, it reverses direction. So it comes to a momentary stop at 4. Similarly, at 1, the velocity vector is changing. So there's a zero velocity here. So these points are pretty similar uh, in terms of their velocity. So let's just look at points one and four. And let's look at their energies. So E equals U plus KE. So that's MGH plus one half MV squared. We just said that their velocities at these points are equal to zero. So this term goes to zero. So this is mgh. These points are at the same height above the h equals zero line, and that height is one meter. So this is going to be equal to mg times one, or simply mg. Okay, what does this tell us? We just solved for the energy, right? That's what we were solving for. Specifically at these points, but energy is conserved. So the energy at one is the same as the energy at four, which is the same as the energy at two, which is equal to the same energy at point three, equals the energy here, 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 here. You get the point. So this is our energy that we are, you know, it serves as a good point of comparison. So let's investigate point three now. Okay? So there is energy there as well, though, and still it's equal to U plus KE, but these specific values of U and KE will be different than what they were at one and four. And clearly because the ball has a different velocity at three than it does at four. So this is going to equal MGH plus one half MV squared. Okay. So we don't really know much about velocity, but we do know its height. What is the height at three? Well, that is the vertical distance from where we're at to the h equals zero line, which is 0 0.5 meters. So we can make the substitution. Uh, I'm gonna substitute a half instead of 0 0.5. Actually, you know what, I'll just do 0 0.5. 
plus one half mv squared, and that's equal to e. Well, we know that e is equal to mg, so why don't we just make that substitution? mg equals 0 0.5 mg plus one half mv squared. And we see that these two terms are pretty similar, so we can subtract this term on both sides, and we'll get, um, let me just like write this out, minus 0 0.5 mg minus 0 0.5 mg on both sides. These cancel. This comes out to 0 0.5 mg, and that's equal to 1 half mv squared. And now, hopefully, you're making a great realization. This right-hand side is simply the kinetic energy, right? We said E equals Ke, which is equal to 1 half mv squared plus this term here. So um, this Ke lent to this term. This term stayed the same here. It didn't change. This did not change here, and that did not change here. So, this is equal to Ke. What is this 0 0.5 mg? This is the same as this right here. mg times 0 0.5. And this came from substituting 0 0.5 for h, which was this term right here. And this mgh is our value for u. So, in fact, our left-hand side equals u. So, at point 0.3... Our potential energy and kinetic energy are the same, so that is our answer, zero, or choice C. Cool. So now we're asked to find the speed of the ball at point 2. Okay, so let us look at point 2. That has energy, U plus Ke, that's equal to MGH plus 1 half mv squared. What is the height at point 2? Hopefully you're shouting it out saying 0, and yeah, absolutely. At point 2, we are on the line h equals 0, so the height equals 0, which means that this term goes to 0. So we have energy at 2 equals uh, 1 half mv squared, and we know that energy at 2 is the same as the energy throughout, so the energy throughout we solved to be mg. This is 1 half mv squared. m's cancel, and we're left with v equals square root of 2 times g, square root of 2 times 9.8, and that's going to be roughly 4.5 meters per second. Answer choice b. So second part was a little bit easier than the first one, but hopefully you can see, once again, energy being super powerful. We found one value for energy, and we just kept rolling with that throughout at all of the different points. Cool. Um, so yeah, really interesting question here, quite in-depth. All right, let's move on to this, another multiple choice. A system consists of two objects having masses m1 and m2, with m1 being less than m2. Interesting. The objects are connected by a massless string, hung over a pulley as shown, and then released. When the object of mass m2 has descended a distance h, the potential energy of the system has decreased by something. Okay, so we're looking at potential energy. So u, initial, that should be equal to the sum of the individual potential energies, right? We have these two objects. Each probably has their associated potential energy with them. So the potential energy of the system is going to be the sum of those two. Okay. So that's going to be m, uh, sorry, m1gh1 plus m2gh2. Right, just by formula. And we want to compare that to some final uh, some final potential energy. So that would be U1F plus U2F. Uh, so 1 and 2 for the two masses, F just for final. So what do we know? Uh, sorry. We know M1 is less than M2. The objects are connected. 
they're released, and m2 descends a distance of h. Okay, so if m1 is less than f m2, then m2 should descend, right? The heavier side will go down. So that makes sense. This goes down some height h. So the mass is somewhere here. What will happen to m1? Well, since the objects are connected via a string, m1 should surely go upwards, right? If m2 is going downwards, this is like the motion of travel. So m1 should surely go upwards. Consider like if it didn't go upwards, what direction would it go? Does it go to the left? No, that makes literally no sense. And similarly to the right, that does, doesn't make sense. Does it go down? Ah, no, not really, because then we would have a really strange pulley. Um, what's going on is M2 is heavier than M1, so this is going to go down. Since this is connected to M1, this force of gravity is not enough to counteract this larger force of gravity. So this force is going to propel the entire system. This full system is going to go downwards. Okay, so what was the point of that? If we know m2 descends by h, then that should tell us that m1 will ascend by h. We know it's going upwards. It's connected by a string. The string is not getting any longer or shorter. So if m2 goes down, m1 has to go up by the same distance. So what is the final height for 1? Well, if we started here and we called this h1, then the final height really depends on where we set the h equals 0 line. So let's erase this for just a moment. And let's consider where should we put h equals 0. We can put it literally anywhere. I'm going to play it really safe and put it like all the way down here, where I'm sure that everything will lie above it. Even if m2 descends as much as possible, it will still be above h equals 0. OK, so initially we're at some point h1, which is like this distance. At some final time, we're up here. So we need this distance. So that tells us that h1f should be the sum h1 plus h. We want this distance. We know what this distance is and this, so we can take their sum. Similarly, for h2, we started here at h2, right? This was h2. Now we've descended quite a bit, and we want this height. So now we can take the difference. h2 minus h will give us the height that we want. So h2f is going to be equal to h2 minus h. Great. With that, we can turn back to our uh, potential energy at the final time. And we see that this is equal to mg, m1gh1f plus m2gh2f. We just solve for what these are right here. So let's make those substitutions. m1g h1 plus h plus m2g h2 plus h. OK. Uh, and now we want to find, we're, we're trying to find the uh, how much the potential energy of the system has decreased. So we're trying to find u initial minus u final. So that will be equal to m1gh1 plus m2gh2, right? That's this right here. And we're going to subtract m1gh1 plus h plus m2gh2 plus h. And this will be, you know, this will require some algebra, but it's worth it to go through it. Um, switch colors. So this is m1gh1 plus m2gh2 minus, uh, do some distribution in here, m1gh1 plus m1gh 
plus m to g h two plus m to g h. Now we have to distribute this minus sign into it. m one g h one plus m two g h two minus m one g h one minus m one g h minus m two g h two. Oh my goodness, minus m two g h. Okay, now we can make some observations. This term and this term cancel. They're the same thing, just opposite sides. Similarly, this term and this term cancel. Cool. So we're left with this delta u is equal to negative m1gh minus m2gh. Uh, I may have messed up a sign. Ah, yes. Okay, wait. Messed up a little bit here. This h2f is h2 minus h, and I put a plus sign there. So this becomes a... Uh, I'll use a different color, minus sign. Similarly, this becomes a minus sign. Uh, this becomes a minus sign. Then when we distribute the minus sign in, it becomes a plus sign. So this should become a plus sign as well. So here we can factor out a GH. This becomes M2 minus M1. And if we look at our answers, do we see that? Yes, we do. Answer choice A, feeling good. Uh, so quite a bit of algebra there. But the key thing to notice here is when we have this sort of system, when one object descends by H, the other one ascends by H, and we have to adjust our final heights accordingly. Brilliant. Um, good question. Well, let's keep chugging along. So... This one may not be as fun as some of the other ones, but the skills we gain from this problem will certainly be helpful. We have a ball that is being launched from the top of a cliff, which is 80 meters high. The ball is 4 kilograms, 0.4 kilograms, has velocity 30 meters per second at time zero. The potential energy of the ball is zero at the bottom of the cliff, and we're told to use g equals 10 meters per second squared. And we are first asked to find the potential kinetic and total energies of the ball at t equals zero. So we're going to draw ourselves a little picture here. So we have this like cliff. The ball is launched off. This is 80 meters. The ball is 30 meters per second, 0 0.4 kilograms. And we're told that the potential energy of the ball is zero at the bottom of the cliff. So remember, u equals mgh. We know that the mass is non-zero. We can see it right there. g is non-zero, which means h must be zero for potential energy to be zero. So that means that we have to draw our h equals zero line right here. Wonderful. Okay, so we have a nice little diagram uh, that helps us out quite a bit. So, at time t equals 0, let's solve for u, m, g, h. Well, we have all of those quantities. Mass is 0 0.4. Gravity is 10, which they told us to use. Height is the vertical distance from where we are at at the time t equals 0 to the h equals 0 line. So that is this height which we are given to be 80 meters. So that's this, and we get 320 joules. Okay, let's do kinetic energy next. One half mv squared. We have both mass and velocity. So at t equals zero, the mass is 0.4 kilograms. Velocity is 30 squared, or that's what v squared is at t equals zero. We compute this out, we get 180 joules. The total energy is equal to U plus KE, and that's equal to 320 plus 180 equals 500 joules. So that is part one. Now we are asked to sketch and label graphs of the potential kinetic and total energies as functions of the distance fallen from the top of the cliff. So this might be a little bit challenging. Well, we have to graph three different quantities. And one of them is quite easy to do. And that is going to be the total energy. Because remember, total energy is conserved. So no matter how far the ball has dropped, the total energy will be the same. It's going to be 
500 at all times. So we can draw a horizontal line uh, for energy and we'll label it with an E. Okay, let's do potential energy next. Uh, change colors. So potential energy is originally 320. So we start here. At the bottom of the cliff, once it has fallen 80, we know that its potential energy is zero. Okay, what else do we know? U is equal to MGH, which means U is directly related to H. So let us analyze this a little bit. I'm going to add a page because I think this is important. So we have U equals MG times H. We agree that G is a constant. G is going to be the same, 9.8, 10 in this case. M is also a constant. Uh, in this case, it's what, 0.4, but it could also be something else. So let's just say that this MG, uh, if we were to compute it out right now, we would get 4. And, whoops, uh, what am I doing? Everything else stays the same. H, U. Now, let's just say... I want to plot U, so let's just say I, instead of U, I call it Y, and instead of H, I call it X, and the 4 stays the same, right? Um, this. Okay. We know how to graph this. This is just a straight line. It's a straight line with slope 4. Now, what if MG was not equal to 4? What if it was equal to negative 14, right? This is still a line. It just has a different slope. So the point is that if we were to graph u in terms of h, it's going to be a line. So coming back to here, we have these two points um, here and here. We know that it's going to be a linear graph, whatever we draw. So we can actually just draw the straight line that connects these points. And that is going to be our graph for u. So hopefully that makes sense. Kinetic energy might be slightly tougher. Let's change colors once again. Well, we know we start out at 180, so we start out somewhere here. The important thing to realize is that total energy is conserved and energy is equal to Ke plus U. So no matter where we are in our graph, the sum of the points of U and Ke should be equal to 500 for E. So for example, at 10, we're somewhere here, which is like 280-ish. So that means our kinetic energy should be 500 minus that 280, so that would be 220, so that would be some point here. So we have to go through that point. At the very end, we have total energy is 500 and potential energy is zero, so kinetic energy should be 500. And sure enough, this is going to be a straight line as well. And you can test it out, take any point or any coordinate here, distance 50 per se, and at 50, we are like maybe at like 120 for U. And for KE, we're like, you know, 370, 380, something like that. And sure enough, the sum of those two is basically 500. So that is our graph as a function of distance. Because now we're going to graph the three as a function of time. So once again, ener total energy is going to stay the same at 500, right? But we can't just leave the graph like this because once the ball hits the ground, it stops moving, it's at h equals zero, so the total energy is zero. So we don't know if the ball has hit the ground at t equals seven yet. It may have already hit the ground in case in that case, the total energy is not equal to 500. So first we need to figure out what is the time it takes for the ball to hit the ground. So I'll quickly redraw the picture just to have a visual. So this goes here, 
This is 80 meters, uh, 30 meters per second, 0 0.4 kilograms. Okay, so how are we going to find the time it takes to fall to the ground? A equals 10 meters per second squared. And that's the big key. And basically, we're going to use kinematics. Um, and the important equation is this one. We have an object in free fall. Uh, it's going in the y direction with this new acceleration. So we're going to use this equation and solve for time. So we know delta y is going to be 80. Its initial y velocity is 0. It has a horizontal velocity, but not a vertical velocity. Uh, and we add to this 1 half 10 times t squared. And if we solve for t, we get t equals 4 seconds. So that means in terms of our graph, our line should stop at t equals 4. Uh, it's close enough. So, cool. Great. So now we have to draw our u and ke graphs. So once again, we know the starting point for u. That's 320. And we know the ending point for u is at 0. So now it remains to figure out what is going on with the ball as it falls down. So initially, right when it leaves the cliff, it's here. After just a split second, uh, it hasn't fallen that much. It's like right there. After a little bit more time, it's fallen a little bit more until it finally hits the ground. It's accelerating, so the velocity is increasing. So initially, right after it leaves, it's not changing. The, the change of height for each small portion of time is quite small. So after maybe like a tenth of a second, the amount of height changed at the very start is going to be much less than the height changed later on within a tenth of a second, because it doesn't have much velocity here. So that means after perhaps a tenth of a second, we're here. This, has still, this still has quite a high potential energy, because it has a very high height. But if we look at another tenth second later, perhaps, um, then we're down here. So the potential energy has decreased substantially. And then down here, it's much lower until it's very, very close to zero. So initially, the potential energy isn't changing all that much until the very end when the ball has a very high speed and it's going down a lot quicker Then the potential energy changes a lot because the height's changing quicker. So we don't have to make this graph exact. We sort of just need a rough sketch of what it's going to look like. So I imagine it to look something like this, where initially the potential energy is about the same. It's decreasing slightly because the ball is still falling, but not as much as later on when the height is changing drastically. So that's sort of what U looks like. So now we need to do a similar thing for kinetic energy. We know it starts at 180. It's going to end up here at 500. And we can think about it. Initially, Remember, kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mv squared. So we should be looking at what the velocity looks like. Initially, it has very small velocity. And when we square these small velocities, it's going to be small numbers. This will increase at a slow rate. But much later on, velocity is changing a lot quicker due to this high acceleration. So that means these numbers are going to get larger and larger, and they're going to be changing more rapidly. So putting that all together, we get something like this. And sure enough, if we do our check of choosing some random time, t equals 3, let's look at where we are on the curve u. Uh, seems like we're at about 180. And we go to uh, our ke curve at t equals 3. Uh, we're at about 320. And the sum of those is indeed 500, so we're good to go. Um, so that's our graph there as a function of time. So maybe not the most exciting question, 
but certainly very helpful. Graph Graphing is such an important skill to have in physics, uh, so hopefully this made sense to you. Uh, these graphs, you know, they don't have to be accurate, like extremely accurate in terms of the, sh uh, the exact shapes. We just need to see that, okay, in this case, it's not linear. Before, where it was linear, you need to show that, okay, we do have straight lines, right? But here, since it's not linear, we don't care about like, oh, is the potential energy actually 280 at time t equals 2? No. What we really care about is you're showing that it's curved and not a straight line for potential energy and kinetic energy. Wonderful. With that said, let's move on to our last question of the day. This one's actually a simple, relatively simple question to end on. Usually I like to do complex problems late, but this one is pretty simple. I'm going to hydrate once again. I've been talking a lot. Hopefully you've had the time to read it. We have this child. I don't know what this child is doing. Um, but they're on a platform onto a rope, and they're swinging in like this circular path. And we want to use conservation of energy to develop an expression for the speed of the child at the lowest point in the swing in terms of g, r, and cosine of theta. OK. So. Uh, first, what we need to do is set our baseline of h equals 0. And we can basically do it wherever we want because we're not given any information about potential energies. So I'm just going to choose h equals 0 to be based off of the lowest point in the arc. All right. So initially, uh, let me just, we're at this point here. And the final point that we're looking at is the lowest point in the arc. So that's down here, right? And we know that the final uh, energy is equal to the initial energy. So initially, we have u0 plus ke0 is equal to mgh0 plus 1 half mv initial squared. And we're told that the initial speed of the child is 0. So that means. Initially, the child has no kinetic energy. So we have E initial equals MGH initial. OK, what about at the final? We have UF plus KEF. That's equal to MGHF plus 1 half MVF squared. And if we're down here, we are at the H equals 0 line. So height will be equal to 0, which means this term goes to 0. And we have EF equals 1 half MVF squared. So if we set these two equal to each other by conservation of energy, we get um, MG, nah. We get MGH0 is equal to 1 half MVF squared. Okay? Great. And we're solving for MVF squared which is, you know, spectacular. And we can do that, but we still have this h0 term, and we want our solution in terms of g, r, and cosine theta. Um, so let's actually try to solve for vf. We notice that the mass is cancel, and we're left with vf is equal to the square root of 2g h0. So I wish we were done, but again, we have this h0 term, and we're not allowed to express it in terms of that, because after all, this is a term this is a variable that we introduce based off of our h equals 0. So let's just go down here. Uh, this is where we are right now. I'm going to redraw what we saw above. Right, We have this, r. This is theta naught. We're here. This is the h equals 0 line. And we're trying to solve for h naught. So what is h naught? It is the vertical height from where we are at to the h equals 0 line. So at the initial point, we're right here. So this would be h naught. How are we going to solve for that? It's a good question. Let's just zoom in a little bit. If this is r, 
and we're following a circular path, then surely this must also be R. Because at some point, this rope and this child is going to reach this point here, and that rope is still going to be of length R. So we have this as R. And we have this as H naught. I don't know why I just rewrote it, but just wanted to keep it closer. Okay, so what are we going to do? We can sort of like draw an imaginary line here and be like, okay, this looks like a right triangle. And specifically, this is the side that we're curious about because this plus H naught would equal R. So uh, let me just shift this over a little bit. Um, okay, so this is H naught here. So that means this must be, uh, let me change colors, R minus H naught. And well, we have two sides of the triangle. We have R and R minus H naught. We have an angle. So why don't we just take the cosine of that angle? Cosine of theta naught is equal to adjacent divided by hypotenuse. So that's equal to R minus H naught divided by R. And we're doing all of this to solve for H naught. And you can see that it's going to be in terms of this theta naught and R, which is good because those are variables that are allowed. So we can multiply both sides by R. We get R cosine of theta naught equals R minus H naught. So H naught equals R minus R cosine of theta naught. Cool. So now we can take this and substitute it back in here. And we will get V equals square root of 2G times R minus R cosine of theta naught. And that's our expression. It's in terms of the variables they asked for, G, R, and cosine of theta naught. We are done with this problem. And in fact, we are done with today's lesson. So as you can see, a ton of applications for um, energy, so many different questions. We've seen it in circular motion. What else? We graphed some stuff previously. Um, we had a pulley in here, a little bit more of like kind of, well, this was like a circular path, but we didn't really use circular motion. Gravitation, roller coasters, where we didn't even know how to approach that. And then, you know, the good old AP problem of analyzing situations. So tons of applications, super powerful. And as you can see, we just use the same equation over and over again. E equals U plus KE equals MGH plus one half MV squared did a bunch of substitutions. And that's usually the power. That's usually the pattern for energy problems. So, yeah, hopefully you learned a lot today and you can see how powerful energy is. That's why it's one of my favorites. Um, so yeah, thank you for tuning into uh, this lesson on physics. And yeah, uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, so that'll conclude our physics lesson for today.